Kankakee Podcast is proudly presented by Pewter Pros, Stitch Prints, and Digital World Design Family of Businesses, celebrating 25 years of small business ownership in Kankakee County. Learn more at mypewterpros.com, stitchprints.com, and digitalworlddesign.com. Thankful for the way these stories hold on To the lifetime we won't get back, I know These rivers carry And welcome to Kankakee Podcast, where we talk about the people and places of Kankakee County. I'm Jake Lamore, and before we get to today's episode, just want to take a look at some upcoming events that are happening in the area, including the Bradley Public Library. They're hosting a Making the Most of Social Security event on May 6th at 10 a.m., and then again May 9th at 5.15 p.m., Topics include maximizing social security benefits, making income distribution decisions, and creating income streams. You can RSVP at bradleylibrary.org or call 815-932-3000. Tickets are now on sale for Kankakee Valley Theater Association's production of In the Heights. This coming weekend is actually the last weekend that you can see the show. It's May 6th and 7th at the Lincoln Cultural Center. You can buy your tickets at kvta.org. And last but not least, the Kankakee County Museum is having their annual Rhubarb Festival on Sunday, May 21st at Small Memorial Park. It's from 10 to 4 p.m. or 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Doesn't cost anything to enter. There's plenty of vendors. There's a pie eating contest, car show, live music, and much more. Kankakee Podcast is actually going to have a booth set up there selling merch. So please stop by and say hello. You can follow Kankakee County Museum on Facebook and Instagram for more details. If you would like your community event mentioned here on Kankakee Podcast, you can email it to me at LamoreMediaLLC at gmail.com for consideration. We are welcoming the friends of Langham Island to Kankakee Podcast, and Langham Island is located on the Kankakee River. It's considered to be a preserve of rare nature. We have Trevor Edmison and John Sullivan, also Molly Bilderback Ulrich. Mm-hmm. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, right. <laughs> and Steve Bo- Bowen? Bowen. Bowen. Bowen okay. is fine. And I did pronounce Trevor. Did I pronounce your last yeah, name right? Edmondson. Uh, Edmondson. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, welcome all of you to the podcast. I guess, actually, I probably should have had you introduce yourself so everyone knows what you <laughs> sound like. <laughs> so we can start with Trevor. Yeah. Hello, yeah, Trevor Edmondson. Hello, John Sullivan. Hello, Molly Ulrich. <laughs> Hello, Steve Bowen. Okay, wonderful. Well, welcome, guys, to the podcast. I'm really excited that we could get this together. And I honestly, this was, I discovered that Langham Island was a thing, just a simple Facebook scroll. I don't remember one of my Facebook friends like shared a picture from the Facebook page that you guys have where you give people updates on what you're doing on the island. And I know that islands exist on the Kankakee River, but I didn't know there was like an official like group of people that were that helped take care of the island and help preserve it and all that. So I was excited to discover that. I guess the first question I have is where exactly is Langham Island on the river? So it's in the state park. It is there's there's a little unincorporated neighborhood called Eltorf out by the state park. There is a a bar at the corner, um, <laughs> which is which that... is now called Jimbo's. Okay, um, okay. I was going to say that must be Jimbo's. Yeah, it used yeah. to be the Parkway. So if you if you could go straight down that road, 
you would run into Langham Island. Okay. In fact, that road, I believe, used to be the main entrance to the park years mm -hmm. and years ago. Wow. Okay. I did not know that. And then, so I, my son and I were just at the state park, I think last week. And when you go through the main entrance and then you go to where that cliff, that mm -hmm. cliff is, that overhang, yeah. that you can mm -hmm. get a nice big view of the river and you can see an island to your, I think it's to your left, is that a different island or is that Langham Island? Could be. Isn't there Willow I, Island? I think it's, that's, a, that's a different island. Yeah, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that's different. Okay. It's an island like that one, probably. There's a, kind of just a dotting of islands through the river there. Okay. It's I know on Google Maps, if you type in like Island View parking lot in the Kankakee State Park, that's that parking lot that's right in front of the island that we go to for our work days. Oh, okay. And the best view of the island, other than being on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, there's just... a little fishing bank right at that parking lot. That's a nice spot to hang out. There's a picnic table, stuff yeah, like that. It's a popular parking area. A lot of people like to pull up there and just chill. Mm -hmm. yeah. The be the best way to get to it is in the Pottawatomie Campground entrance. Yes. Because you go yeah. down, you can avoid the, you know you can go through this main state park entrance. But yeah, but the Pottawatomie is technically if you're coming from Bourbon A, it's before the right. main entrance, Correct. right? right. Correct. Yeah. It's a sooner entrance. Yeah. And, yeah. And the island parking lot is literally at the hill, at the bottom of the hill before you go up to the campground. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to keep going, driving up there. Mm -hmm. so okay. It's right there. So how did Langham Island become Langham Island as far as like there being a group to preserve it? Uh, <laughs> well, Langham Island is, you, know, you mentioned there's lots of islands on the river, but Langham Island is unique. In many ways, there I think there's over seventy islands. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's that many. Yeah, yeah. Within something. within like the whole stretch of the river, from like state line over to like the Medewin area. I mean, there's probably even more, but, but the ones you can see on the map anyway. But a lot of those islands flood regularly. They are inundated, you know, underwater. So not a lot can persist there. A lot of disturbance. Where Langham Island and maybe a couple others are made of this dolomite limestone that kind of sticks up out of the water. So no matter how high the river gets, the top part of the island never floods, basically. So that's a little refuge for, for things that can live there. And it's the island has been in the consciousness. I think it goes in and out of consciousness uh, through history. I think you know where we first pick it up is in 1872 when the botanist E.J. Hill, who's who's a renowned botanist, it's, uh, he's University of North Carolina, I think Herbarium is named after him, but he was a school teacher in Kankakee and also a pastor uh, in Kankakee County back in the late 1800s. And But a lot of your botanists and scientific folk back then were, you know, had other careers, but this was their hobby, right? This was their thing they did. And he would go out and document plants along the Kankakee River and he first visited the island and the surrounding area, like I said, in 1872 and, and started taking and documenting the plants there. And that's where we first learned kind of about the significance of Langham Island and how he describes it. Most of the other islands are not described in any meaningful way. But what he discovered there were several plants, including the Kankakee Mallow, which exists today on no other island except for Langham Island naturally in the world. It, it's been taken off. There's it, like, People grow it in their yards. I have it in my yard. Okay. Mm -hmm. But naturally occurring, that's the only spot that we have. Would you that, say it's endemic to the island? Is that what that means? Yes. Yeah, yeah endemic, yeah, meaning that's, yeah. That's, that's, where that's, it's, that's where it was born, mm -hmm. right? And, and you can, yeah, and you can speculate, you know, uh, that it probably existed other places. There's lots of dolomite limestone around that similar soil uh, around the area. Uh, Rock Creek Canyon is like that. Is, dol is dolomite the type of limestone that can purify water? Is that, or is that a different, am I confusing? It's, it probably would be similar, maybe yeah. made up of the same kind of like. Because there is a, a certain type of limestone that helps kind of purify water, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. I think that, that chalky calcium. Yeah, yeah. I think chemical. the technical dolomite technically is just limestone, but with some magnesium in it. Mm. Okay. So limestone is mostly calcium yeah. and carbonate, mm. and dolomite has magnesium in as well. So you're more minerals then to offer, right? Or, yeah, a different I mean, type is... of, yeah, a different <laughs> array of minerals, which yeah. it does have plants that are uh, you know, preferential to adapted to that type of soil yeah. uh, substrate. 
Yeah. And what's unique about this area, you can go to Perry Farm and see it as well, is that the limestone is very close to the surface. Mm -hmm. So the, the soil above it is, is is very shallow. And Langham Island is the same way. There's just a handful of inches of soil. Some of it's exposed. But anyway, you know, and it was kind of discovered and there, there were unique plants in this area. And botanists, you know, f decades after that would visit the island and, and check on things. And, you know, it probably, the way it sits out of the water like that was probably a spot for Native Americans to go, you know, when during flood time. I'm sure, you know, there were Potawatomi villages in the state park, right? So a lot of factors, but not just the Kankakee Mallow. I have this paper here, the vascular flora of Langham Island from March 1991. And it's got over 300 different species listed for the island. And the island is about 20 acres or so. Uh, give or take. So, and are those all just native to the island, or are those found in other parts of like the state park? Uh, most of them would be found other places. There are, okay. few, you know, but there are, are a concentration certainly of rare species that would occur in very specialized habitats on the island. But it's incredibly rare to have that amount of concentrated, you know, species in one spot, let alone an island in the middle of the river. Yeah. Right. That's not, it's, it's something you might see in like a really high quality remnant prairie or, you know, of much larger size. And is that because of that, going back to that type of limestone, is that why there's such a high concentration or? Part of it. I think it also is the nature of the island is that it's protected out there, mm -hmm. right? By default, it's hard to get to. The currents around the island are pretty quick pretty swift. So, and during most parts of the year, you can't get out there at all because the river's just either too icy or too, too flood. You can't even get over there. And it also wasn't, it was, people tried to farm it off and on, but because really? the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah wow. absolutely. But, it, but how big is Langham Island? I mean, it's uh, about 20 acres. Yeah. So a, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah it's 20 acres. Easily yeah. hike oh. the whole thing several times in a work day. If oh, you see, I didn't know it was that big. <laughs> yeah. 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 It is. That's a yeah. lot. It is. That's more than what mm -hmm. I thought it was. Yeah. I and thought maybe we were talking like five or 10 acres. I mean, five yep. or 10 acres is probably what's been opened up by the work, work crew. Right. Maybe about half of the island is covered in very, very dense, mostly invasive shrubbery that's kind of hard to hike back into just because it's so thick. So half of it is still kind of behind the wall of invasive plants that we're trying to go out there and get rid of. So the nice stuff on the other half of the island that Trevor has been talking about has more room to grow into, maybe, hopefully. So <laughs> And I just want to say that this discussion, why is the island unique, leads to one of the things that I like best about doing this eco-restoration work. I have no background in, in botany. I don't know anything about plants to speak of other than what I've learned from these folks. And you can do this kind of stuff with no knowledge and no skills. The first couple of work days that I went to, it was like, okay, we're going to be cutting this invasive honeysuckle. Steve, you carry it over to the fire. <laughs> you know, that I can do. Yeah. Someone has to do it, though. <laughs> yeah. But, but this discussion about, well, what's special about the limestone? Why is the island unique? Partly because of the isolation, you know, partly. All of that interplay you can dive into any aspect of it that you want. The plants reflect the soil and the climate and the insects and birds and other fauna that are there. And it's just really cool to be connected to all of those connections. Yeah. I guess that would have been important to dive into. I apologize. But like no, we, to like Trevor, to like your background, I know you have some... I don't know if you're, are, are you a, essentially a botanist or are you just have been around the nature of the Kankakee River Valley so much that you just know a lot of these things? I identify you know, more as a naturalist, a ecologist with, you know, I'm, I like a lot of different things. I'm not maybe special in any things, but you know, friend, friends of Langham Island, Langham Island really shaped my career quite a bit when you know, your original question was kind of about how Langham Island, Friends of Langham Island got formed. And back in 2014, I moved here from DeKalb, my wife, who's a teacher in Bourbonnais, 
And I was working as a seasonal employee at the Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie. And I was desperate to kind of like hone my skills. And like I was fresh out of college. I didn't have any network of people in here. And, you know, I started meeting people and learning about the high quality natural areas. And it was around the the summer of 2014 that the Illinois Native Plant Society had their annual gathering at Camp Shawanasi, uh, which is also another great natural area. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. In general. But anyway, uh, one of the field trips for that gathering was to take a, a canoe kayak trip out to Langham Island because everybody knew that the Kanki Mala was out there, but very few people ever set foot out there because it's just, like I said, difficult to get to. And, you know, if you're not, you got you to gotta come prepared to get out there. Because you're going against the current to get there, right? Usually, well, depending on you're going where across the current. across the current. Yeah. Well, and that's is, hard too. It is fast yeah. there. <laughs> they went out there, and you know, all these these are great botanists from around the state. People who you know, professionals, right? And and and, and folks, you know, that are more more recreational. But they went out there, and they couldn't they couldn't even get on the island. Really, I mean, without shedding blood, basically, because <laughs> the the shrubs. You know, if you look around any of our preserves around Kankakee, Prairie Farm, the State Park, you know, uh, any of the forest preserves, there's a lot of honeysuckle in there. Uh, dense, dark honeysuckle. And what is what does honeysuckle look like? Is that the the shrub that has like all the sticky things on it? No. Or the prickly, you know what oh, I'm talking I know what about? You're talking it gets about. stuck yeah. in it's your clothes. It's not like a burr plant. No, it's okay. um, and there's a couple of kinds, right? There's an invasive sure. vine honeysuckle, but this yeah. is a more of like a woody shrub, kind yeah, of this like a is, small tree looking. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's a bush honeysuckle and mm -hmm. it 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 fly, it puts out leaves early. It's aggressive. It's a mere honeysuckle, you want to call it. Originally from Asia, but it escaped um, cultivation and you know, as an ornamental plant and has dominated basically since the mid I think it escaped early 1900s, but since the mid uh, 1900s has just been overrunning our forests mm -hmm. and not something that, and you know, my generation, Molly's generation, that's pretty much all we know mm -hmm. about when we look at forests. That's what we think it should look like is mm -hmm. because that's all our forests are dominated by the shrub. And the, but and it's not even, not even from the area. Yeah, <laughs> it, Correct. Hasn't, it hasn't evolved with the other members of our local ecosystem, essentially. So, so. A, a native Illinois wooded area, you could see through. You right. can just see through. And there are hardly any of those around. Yeah. It's, it's so the just, honeysuckle you, really kind yeah, of if it you, takes... Um, if you go to that Island View parking lot at the state park and you look at the island across the river, to your right you'll see the area that's been opened up and you can almost see to the trees on the other side of the river. But if you look upstream on the left-hand side, it's going to look really dense and brushy and that's basically the difference before and after of what the honeysuckle does to our woodland native ecosystem. You were going to say something, John. Well, the honeysuckle has a white, fragrant flower, and it's mm. in bloom right now. So it is, in mm. the springtime, it's enjoyable. Then it just leaves out, and it really takes over and mm -hmm. just darkens things in the woods. Mm -hmm. So the woods should be, like Steve was saying, they should be a lot more open naturally than the way mm. they were before. And we don't, how exactly did that make its way into the... Well, it, after it makes those nice flowers, it makes berries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and okay. birds love, love eating them. berries. Oh, okay. and <laughs> I think, yeah. I bet, the, I'm sure those are mm -hmm. grow in my backyard then. I bet I know it's exactly. It's very likely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's probably part of it, the yeah. problem, the biggest problem with it, there's so many, but it, it's, <laughs> it's horribly invasive, but it's the first thing to leaf out. Mm -hmm. So it keeps the sunlight from getting to the forest floor. And it's also the last thing to drop its leaves. So it chokes off all of the native stuff that has evolved over time mm -hmm. to, you know, to feed the insects, to feed mm -hmm. the birds, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So really, you're uh, specifically to the island, and I'm sure there's efforts being made to probably get rid of it in other natural places. But yep. specifically to the island, are you trying to get rid of it completely? Uh, yeah. The honeysuckle? Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, exactly. Which will be difficult because the state park and the surrounding, you know, there's seed banks. Mm -hmm. birds yeah, so the them. birds bring them. Yeah, the birds right? right across the river will bring them right back to the island. So that's kind of why it needs a continual sort of commitment to be 
maintained in some way. Um, part of that is just invasive removal, but there's a whole lot of, it's a whole list of maintenance chores, essentially, you have to keep doing. It, it used to be when things were dedicated nature preserves or private conservation, you would just purchase the land and, and walk away from it and mm -hmm. just let nature be nature. But that is... That model is out of date, and uh, and you, why is that though? I mean, why why can't we just let let it be its thing and just walk away? And mostly, I mean, invasive species management. If you just let honeysuckle take over your forest or island, in this case, all those those three hundred and some plants that are in the the flora here would not be able to compete with it, and mm -hmm. would slowly and slowly just go away. And if you look in really dense honeysuckle places, it's mostly bare soil under there mm -hmm. or other seedlings of new honeysuckle coming up. So there's very little things that can actually grow in that environment. So your diversity, which is important for preserving all nature, uh, just slowly withers away to about nothing. So you need to have an active hand in that. It's not, not going to disappear overnight. And there are other invasives besides honeysuckle to think about. But also, Langamon is a great example. The Kanky Mile is a great example. We need active management such as fire out there mm -hmm. to a lot of those seeds from these plants require fire to germinate. And, you know, we're not out west where lightning strikes are just going to uh, start a wild start a wildfire fire. necessarily. Yeah. It, you know, in theory it could happen, but it's not very common here. It used to happen with railroads around here. But again, there's no railroad running through Langham Island. And most of our natural areas are not adjacent to railroads. And it's also just rare to have a, a train fire yeah, anymore. I prefer to yes. not have a railroad yeah. fire also. You're right. So, <laughs> Usually that doesn't happen. So, yeah. you know, and we knew Native Americans lit fires and, mm -hmm. you know, that was mm -hmm. part of their. So, yeah, you got to have an active, be out there actively managed. It's a, it's a forever journey. So what mm -hmm. does fire do then in this case? So actively of lighting these fires, but you have to do it in a certain way, obviously. And I mean, so that that you're <laughs> saying that helps germinate the seed mm -hmm. or does it give it some type of, of nutrient? That... So um, some seeds require actually heat to chemically, something chemically alters inside the seed and the heat is what triggers the germination of the seed. Is that, that yeah, yeah one of the things that fire does? That. Um, it also will, in this case, perhaps I'm not sure what set of invasives respond this way, but some invasive plants aren't adapted to withstand fire. So by clearing out the undergrowth of the island with fire, you're kind of giving chance to stuff that's adapted to have been burned to kind of get a leg up on competing. And fire places. allows more competition mm -hmm. instead of one plant just completely taking over the It kind the of area. sets it back and levels the playing field a bit. And <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, just I mean, like a lot of our native species are adapted to fire, and the invasives generally are not for various physical or chemical reasons. And you know, running fire through an area really, yeah, provides stimulates you know a lot of growth. That people think of fire as this you know bare soil, clear, but usually after a fire, a lot more things flower. Uh, you're going to get a lot more germination. Um, you're going to the a lot of nutrients from that fire get back put back into the soil. The invasive management, like I said, honeysuckle is and others. The a lot of them have shallow root systems because their their goal is to just grow fast and and uh, that's mm -hmm. so expand. the reason why that's why the roots that's are shallow. That's why they're so aggressive. Yeah. Also, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and so they they want to get their life cycle done. So you know, fire can penetrate a couple you know inches down into the soil and 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 reduce some of that impact too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a it's an important tool for all natural areas in in our region here. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's it, it's important to realize that fire has been an important management tool as long as humans have been in mm -hmm. this area. Of course, the the indigenous peoples, the Native Americans, understood that fire would rejuvenate the prairies that were here naturally. I don't. They probably knew that fire would help keep the trees down mm -hmm. and keep it as prairie. But they were mainly interested in rejuvenating the prairie for all of the plants that they would harvest for their medicines and their food and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Today, fire is an important tool for maintaining the plant diversity. As I mean, that's what defines a, a high quality natural area is plant and animal diversity. And and so 
as they were saying, all of these things evolved with fire. So and it's, it's yeah. It's, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I also think it's worth mentioning, um, Trevor was saying, you know, we're not like we are out west where lightning is probably going to strike fire. Yeah, we don't get that dry usually. Um, yeah, usually. Yeah. But that is worth considering why so many plants on the island are fire adapted. I would postulate it's likely that human lit fires are part of the evolution of the plants that we see there as well. So that's interesting to think about how far back human activity of maintaining the island probably has gone. Um, and we've kind of stopped doing it. For a while, maybe we're starting to get back to that sort of behavior with nature. John, were you going to say something? No. <laughs> there's there's, there's probably fire in the, not just the island, but in the state park and all, mm-hmm. and all around sure. there. Because that was all inhabited by the pot of water. And they actually yeah. did just do a prescribed burn over by the uh, visitor center, I think, at the state park. So okay. they're starting to return fire to other areas of yeah. the park, too. Well, I've noticed Perry to Farm does that. Perry yes, Farm as well, yeah. Do, yeah. Which yeah. is also a prairie, a uh, tall grass prairie, right? Um, type right. of ecosystem, which prairies are typically very good carriers of prescribed burns. Yeah. You've got a nice, tall, dry prairie that burns very well. Yeah, I would imagine it's a little easier than maybe like on Langham Island. I don't know. Well, and how that actually often, is a big part it, of the challenge. How often do you do that? <laughs> well, I, the DNR leads that, but in the early years, we couldn't get a fire out mm-hmm. there. Because, because there, there was, was too much. Well, actually, because there's not enough fuel, yeah, right? No, so uh, that honeysuckle chokes out the underbrush, which is what carries the fire, those grasses and lower growing things that the honeysuckle is blocking the light from reaching the ground. So right. that bare, bare dirt under the honeysuckle just doesn't burn. There's nothing to carry the fire. Right. It's kind of how it all net, networks back together. These yeah. the problems kind of network the same way that the ecology networks. And so yeah. it was it was a big chore was first getting rid of as much honeysuckle as you could, and then right. you could burn. Or it, it really took a couple. I mean, there were so. In the on the island, you you have you need a mixture of grasses, sedges, and oak leaf litter to mm-hmm. burn. The honeysuckle was choking out the oaks, and the grasses weren't really present. So you really had to open it up and let the grasses recover. We you know you could collect, hand collect some and scatter it and try to get it to grow right to get the fire to carry. And then the next couple of years, it was really patchy, like because you maybe get you'd open up an area, it would recover a little bit. Um, but then the area right next to it where we hadn't started clearing, we would just be this bear. So it's it, you're just marching across the island, which is still going on today, trying to build up that fuel so that, yeah, you can get these consistent fires and each fire may be a little hotter. And you'll see different effects mm-hmm. to it. You'll control the honeysuckle better if you have a hotter fire and hopefully get more germination, which back in 2014 when the, you know, the Native Plant Society was out there, they found zero honeysuckle, or zero Kankakee mallows. Mm-hmm. And now there's how much? Do you know? Like Have we a, lost count yet? There's a lot. There's yeah, a lot okay. of mallows it's, out it's there. It's many yeah. hundreds of stalks and probably yeah. a few hundred individual plants. And the Kankakee mallow is is what exactly? I, I don't feel. I don't think we got it into that exactly. I know people might be familiar <laughs> with the name, but you know, what does it look mm-hmm. like and what does it do? Yeah, do you want to talk about the botany of the mallow family? Uh, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> well, actually, the most similar species is somewhere out in West Virginia. Is that right? Right, there's one in the mountains. Over it's that a way. pretty. Oh, okay. I thought it was only native to. Well, so the Kankakee, Kankakee mallow spe- specific species was it Iliamna remota. Remota. The next closest mallow. relative is somewhere out in the mountains in West Virginia. So it's very. That's. Yeah, it's, it's that's wild. <laughs> it is <laughs> wild. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, but what's what would a mallow be most similar to, like a common? It's a pretty pink flower. It's about maybe three, four feet tall. Well, so. actually, I have a tattoo of the top of the. Oh, is that, so that's <laughs> yeah, a mallow. So, See, that's perfect. Yeah, so, um, this yeah. is what the flower looks like. It's okay. a five petaled, almost looks kind of like a cherry blossom, but it's not related to cherries closely at all. But, but it's pinkish. Yeah, but visually, it is just like a pink five petaled flower. Um, it grows a few flowers grow on the top of a stem, and it's got these cool um, five-lobed leaves that get actually pretty big, sort of like a little palmy-looking leaf. And the plant itself is, what would you say, maybe five to— I'd say five or some or Five six. foot yeah. tall, probably. Really? Yeah, so it's about wow. as, Yeah, I'm about the same height as a Kinkakee Mallow as well. <laughs> I didn't know they were that big. Yeah, they're quite large plants, yeah. It's, um, I don't know if I've ever— 
I, I'm sure I've seen one. They like, blew, when they bloom in the summer, absolutely, you could come out and uh, give them a look. We should do like are, a yeah, slow hike absolutely. on the island. That would be awesome. Yeah. I would love that. That yeah. would be a, like a great outing for our patrons. Let's oh, see if we can get some, some of our uh, yeah. podcast patrons. They are there. similar to a hibiscus. A lot of, a lot of hibiscus yes, grow yeah. along the bank, and a lot of people confuse the <laughs> mallow with the hibiscus. So if you know what a hibiscus mm. looks like, you have a pretty good idea of what the mallow is. Yeah. So how can you determine the difference between, if they're so similar, what, uh, between a hibiscus and That's when you the start mallow, getting can... into understanding the specific botany of each individual species of plant. I would say the basic difference, just for Kankakee, the, the hibiscus that, that we know, the, the, the halberd-leaved rose mallow, grows along the river bank. Like it's a flood plant mm -hmm. right and so that's the one people fishermen will say oh i saw the kanky mallow you know whatever it similar structure but it's it's wet where the kanky mallow itself is high and dry it mm -hmm. it's not along the river it doesn't like to be flooded out so those are that 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 gradient is a is so a there's a good chance if you're seeing a, a a plant a flower that you think is a mallow right along the river it's most likely not the kankakee mallow it is not yeah, yeah. Okay. it's they the, also the rose have a, a much darker pink center True. to the flower okay. also, to yeah. me see i have a, a color deficiency i'm kind of oh. colorblind i mean i can see color but certain shades are hard to see so like mm -hmm. when i've seen pictures of the kankakee mallow i always thought it looked more white than it is a very pale pink also yeah. i would say the flowers are much smaller on the kankakee mallow yes also. definitely the, the swamp not swamp mallow. What the is hibiscus? it? Hibiscus. The I, hibiscus. Yeah. We have a native species of hibiscus, which is what the the lower wetter species is. Okay. Those flowers are much larger around in diameter than the kinky yep. mallow is. Yeah, I've seen the mallow I've seen pictures of. It looks very small. It the is flower. pretty small, yeah. Maybe yeah. a couple inches across for the entire bloom size. Okay. Yeah. But it blooms. The one in my yard, I bought seed. I didn't harvest it. <laughs> uh, well, you yes, could have, though, right? Yeah. Or, or, or is, it, it's, it, it, no, is, it, a, is that illegal? It's illegal. Is it, yeah, is it, it's it's is an endangered illegal, yeah. plant? But, um, it's a state endangered plant. It's yeah. So it's illegal to harvest. And it's a nature preserve, which has another. Yeah, oh, that's true. To, you're yeah, not remove, supposed to harvest yeah. from nature preserves. <laughs> But um, yeah. Prairie Moon Nursery, they Pr sell Prairie Kankakee Moon, you can get some seed. seed from there. But yeah. mine usually start blooming, uh, similar to the island, or early to mid-June. Mm -hmm. But it goes through all summer. Like, they'll just, I mean, it, it's not like a one-and-done thing. They're, I'll have blooms for maybe into September sometimes. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So it's a, a very beautiful and, and gardening-friendly plant, yeah, even though a, it's nice, rare. <laughs> nice yard plant, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I think people would enjoy it. I'm curious. Did you uh, did you heat treat the seed to germinate? Uh, How did I, you... Some of them I did. So I have like a little prairie thing in my front yard where I'll 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 burn through that every year. But then other times I would I would put grass clippings in like a like a little bucket or something and mm -hmm. like or yeah and then light that on fire. But briefly, you don't want to do it like <laughs> too much um, because you don't you know it's just, it's just the fire like naturally just kind of passing over yeah. it and you know whatnot. But I feel like we need to have a uh, yeah disclaimer. <laughs> like a disclaimer, Trevor but also certified... maybe we need to have Trevor like teach a class on how to <laughs> properly how to germ yeah a work yeah. a yeah. Kankakee mallow seed germination how to germinate workshop. yeah how to germinate your Kankakee mallow yeah yeah and there's other ways you can do it but you know uh, I think yeah the fire is the more natural mm -hmm. natural way sure so yeah back in 2014 there were zero and uh, we all kind of gathered um, I was volunteering at the state park at the time um, actually at the archery range where you guys work yeah, now the, yep. the hidden savanna there because nice. it was so it's such a it deserves its own thing uh, back there uh, but Kim Roman our nature reserve commissioner said you know uh, we really need to divert energy to this because this is like if we lose the kanki mallow that's the last that's the last in not only endemic to um uh, langham island it's endemic to illinois mm -hmm. you know and that's really the last place there was only a few plants ever known to be endemic to illinois and the kanki mallow is really the last one wow um and uh and so we 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 got together a few of us and started like brainstorming i think it was as early as august um we went out there and like what do we got to do um, to get 
uh, support and get a group going. And, you know, we we got to get some equipment. To, the first thing to do is just cut a path on to get to the island. We didn't. Like didn't, once you get to the bank. Yeah. Once like, you get to the bank. How, how do you get? <laughs> how do you get over there? Is the You know, you can in the summer, you can, you know, fishermen wade over there occasionally. But we had to acquire a rowboat. Actually, former Daily Journal outdoor com, Dale Bowman, uh, or not Dale Bowman, uh, sorry, Rob, uh, Bob Themer donated his rowboat to the to the group to make this happen. But anyway, yeah, and and so we started. We we you know I had worked in restoration at Medewin, so I knew kind of had went at the state park and then put out this big call to action. We we're in the southern edge of what we call the Chicago Wilderness region here, and. Chicago, the region is kind of where you can go up to Madison, you know, kind of where restoration is a big incubator for restoration and ecological management for the rest of the country, really, and especially in Prairie and Savannah. And so we we put out a call to action. We had some Stephen Packard, who's a well, celebrity, well-known guy in, in this, uh, Kim Roman, you know, she works more than just Kanky County, various other people. And I think we got like 30 or 40 people to show up. It was kind of a big deal because people had heard about the Kinky Mallow, but we needed to save it because there were zero plants. And we don't know how long those seeds are going to like sit there in the soil and just be viable. Sure. Eventually they just, you know. They'll die out. They, yeah. Or they just won't germinate anymore. And it wasn't the first time. So I preface this wasn't the first time that restoration on the island had been attempted. I Working at Medewin. I worked with ecologist Bill Glass there, who was the, he, he worked and retired from a day one as the the main prairie ecologist there. But before that, he worked for the DNR in Illinois and was the biologist for this area. And what's the DNR? Uh, Department of Natural Resources. Okay. So yeah, state park and natural okay. preserves. So anyway, I happened just to happen to work with Bill there at a day one. We started talking about this, and he's like, "Well, when I was working at DNR, they had actually him and." This other guy, Randy Hydorn, and the state botanist at the time, uh, John Schwegman, did a. They started in 1983, going out to the island. They realized, you know, this is this is in bad shape, and they started monitoring. So I have this table here of all their their data from 1983 to 2002, and they started going out there regularly and trying to clear honeysuckle out because it was the same. Like, same thing. Same thing. Like you said, it goes in and out of consciousness since E.J. Hill discovered them in the late eight, you know, 1870s. And people realize this is a special place. I mean, it got enrolled as a nature preserve, so it was obviously identified as such. But you got to get out there and get your hands dirty. And so these folks had done that. But Bill moved to Medewin. John Schwegman retired. And there was a gap from about 20. 2003, we'll say, until 2014, where there was just no real active management on the and island. Several years. Several years, yeah. Honeysuckle. Oh, to come get back, oh, yep. uh, gain control gain again. Gain control. Yep. Cool. And, and that's when it all culminated. And, and that's how Friends of the Langham Island was formed, is that this was this big call to action that we need to, this is, we're going to benefit the whole island, but the mallow is kind of this mascot, I'll say. And what also makes it unique is most endangered plants, we don't really talk about their location. Like say, oh, there's a rare orchid over here. Let's not like broadcast that to the world. But mm -hmm. Langham, the Kanky Mallow is kind of different because we were like nearly on the brink of losing it. And we knew we could get a lot of support and we we thought we could. And we thought if we just got some, some effort out there and it, it's not... It, it, the seed is commercially available, right? You can go out and get it. So we weren't too worried about like, like poaching. So we made an active decision, uh, not just me, but the DNR, and said, hey, let's let's promote this. It's going to be and get people out there. So we were basically in 2014, started row, rowing out there at least once a month and doing clearing honeysuckle was the main objective. It seems like you're out there a couple times a month now. Now. <clears> now from what I see. Yeah. Early on, you, you know, we didn't have a core group established. Right. The people were coming from all over. We got people. It was kind of like this bucket list thing for people were driving two hours to come volunteer. Wow. <laughs> from yeah. the north side of Chicago, from Indiana, from Springfield, you know, wherever, because they, this was like the thing, we, like I said, that big call to action. And like, we got to save this plant. We got to all come together for this moment, basically. And but once we started doing more regular work days, yeah, there were locals. You know, we can't depend on people coming from two hours every mm -hmm. time, no. right? Mm -hmm. it, it's got to be a locally driven thing. And this is what you're you're seeing here now over those years. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I got to give a shout out to, to Trevor and to Kim Roman. Mm -hmm. I mean, Trevor 
his leadership from 2014 through whatever, 16, 17, 18, I'm not sure, really kind of kept the thing going. Kim, of course, she's she's a state employee, but she's in charge of over 100 nature preserves. She's got, I don't know, 30 counties or some yeah, ridiculous. That's insane. Thing. Yeah. She's a busy lady. So, oh, so oh the, How can one person possibly <laughs> manage That's a great 100? question. <laughs> it's impossible to um, Nature preserves. Yeah. But, but yeah, so we do now have kind of a core group of people who are more local. There's maybe six or eight of us. And we try to get out there every week, either alternating Thursdays or Saturdays. In the winter, we hardly ever get out to the island, so we've identified because the river uh, mm -hmm. refuses to cooperate. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, so we've identified an alternate site within the state park that we that we work on. That's also pretty special. But mm -hmm. but stepping back, we've been talking about how special the island is. But I think a lot of folks from the Chicago region broadly really don't understand how incredibly beautiful and unique this region is. Mm -hmm. Chicago became a major metropolis because of it's it's a transportation hub, the rivers, the railroads, the lakes. The lake. yep. And from a nature standpoint, it is also a transportation hub. This is the southern end of Lake Michigan is where numerous birds migrate through either going farther west, farther north. There's just an amazing mix of plants and animals that in this region, it's either the southernmost expanse of this species or the northernmost or the eastern or westernmost. It's just this <laughs> incredible mix of stuff that it's, it's just at the boundary. It's really cool. Yeah. I mean, it's just think about all the things that have cultivated from from what you're talking about it it wasn't just a transportation hub for humans it was also yeah. also for animals and still is to this day obviously it's a little different mm -hmm. for for that nowadays unfortunately mm -hmm. but it's really cool that you guys are helping preserve what we have left mm -hmm. of <laughs> of the botany yeah. uh, side of things, or just ecosystems. In Maybe general. we could say yeah. a little bit about preserves in general. I mean, mm -hmm. it was about mm -hmm. in the seventies that the state went, went around and did an inventory of all these really unique and high quality places in Illinois. And I mean, there's a list of them. And Kankakee has, State Park has three sites, and one of them is the island. So these places have been identified, brought to the attention of people. They know where they are. They're really unique. They're worth visiting. The neat thing about the island is it's right in our backyard. So, And I think a lot of us take it for granted. We're, we're kind of in a semi-rural area. We have a lot of nice woods. Mm -hmm. And we people from Chicago area really realize it when they come out here. And mm -hmm. they say, wow, this is a really beautiful area. And we, we think it'll be here forever, and maybe it won't be. So yeah, true. we just want to... Uh, try and enjoy it and preserve it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we do really have a advantage of you can easily live in a very like urban the urban environment that we have, you know, like the Tri-City area, Bradley, Bourbon, Kankakee, even Mantino kind of creeping into that uh Tri-City part and you can be in that <clears throat> very busy hub but then you can easily like just go a few miles out and you're in mm. <laughs> you're in nature. Yeah. You're at yeah. the you're at the state park. You it's know. a huge draw of the area. Yeah. Know? Um. Even I live in town in Kankakee in the city, but I also live by you know a great trail that's right along the river that could have been dug up for a hotel to be built there. Sure. But it's a you know the city decided to keep it available to the public. And I've seen red foxes on that trail. I've seen pretty surprising birds that are somewhat rare for an urban environment out on, out on that trail. And I just think it's great that our local area seems to, at least on an intuitive level, understand that the nature is a value of 
this location. People go kayaking on the river. Yeah, we have. You know, kayaking. Reeds has been doing kayak and canoe trips for as long as I can remember. Years. I've been in the area. Like probably 50, 60, yeah. 70 years yeah. <laughs> at this point. People come from the Chicago area to do that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The, 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 I've only been one time. I'm going to go again this year when we were on or in one of those big vans that they bring you in to transport you to your starting point. The the other group that was in that big passenger van with my family was from Chicago. Oh, nice. <laughs> they weren't even from here, you know. Yeah. So awesome. Well, it was yeah. it was kind of funny. <laughs> it's great that they can come and enjoy the Kingakee River as well. You know that there's still something there to appreciate about the nature of the area. Oh yeah, yeah. I've there, we've been all over the place, and this uh, really excites me. But what what else is is very important to get out there about Langham Island? And obviously, anyone can volunteer too. I want to point that out? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me personally, I mean, it's obviously shaped my life in many ways. But I Langham Island in is kind of an incubator, I think, mm-hmm. and that we have all these great natural areas in Kankakee area, but not all of them have active management or stewards or p- local mm-hmm. people advocating mm-hmm. on their behalf. And what I hope uh, Langham Island can do is provide that skill set, provide that background for folks to see. Once you once you see Honeysuckle, once you see the management being done, it really opens your eyes to the rest of the natural areas in the county or the region. And Mo- hopefully motivates people to really think as they're going on their walk in the woods and, and thinking about kind of the ecology in a little bit different way. Um, and you mentioned those kayak trips. A lot of those drive, you know, f- go right by Langham Island. Uh, yeah, as you exactly. go through, you're going to paddle right by it. So, and, you know, I, I don't know how many people appreciate, you know, people have heard of the Kankakee Mallow, but like, r- like I want it to be a, a, something that's identified with this community, you know, like, Moments has the uh, with the gladiolus. Gladiola. Yeah, we, yeah. we, we should we could have a Kankakee Mallow <laughs> yeah, Festival. Yeah, we could. You know? we Absolutely uh, we could. And it could be on Langham Island. I, I, <laughs> I am pounding the pavement to get when we do the when Kankakee, you know, does the river improvements to have Kankakee Mallows planted with some information there. Because I think it's a it's a point of pride and, and I think that should be celebrated. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, it, so getting out to any of these natural areas, I think, is important to uh, when I come home from a work day, I'm physically very tired, but emotionally rejuvenated. Mm-hmm. It, it really is. It, it's it's just good for people to be out with nature and in nature and of nature. And it's important to build networks of people. You know, Trevor mentioned, of course, we're kind of representing Friends of Langham Island. That's kind of a subset of Friends of Illinois Nature Preserves. Mm -hmm. There's Friends of the Kankakee that works on the Kankakee Sands areas, both down in Iroquois County, far south, southeastern Kankakee County, a little bit in Will County. Also mentioned the Illinois Native Plant Society and the Extension Service offers a master naturalist program that, you know, I started in this with no knowledge of botany and I still have next to no knowledge of botany. <laughs> Sounds like you've learned a lot, but though. <laughs> But you can dig into it as much or as little as you want. And there's there's these interlocking networks of people who understand that humans are of nature. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, we often forget that we're, we heavily lived along with nature for many years and, and with uh, the urban areas that have been built up around us, we often forget that, oh, yeah, that's right. We uh-huh. used to be a little more like it was – that was the day-to-day. You were in the woods yeah. every day <laughs> walking yeah. through the woods, you know. And nowadays, it's you're walking on the street and there's maybe a tree over there, but then you don't see another tree for how long, you know. So yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we the often, lines with what Steve was saying, I mean, I agree. I know you've had some guests on about mental health. Mm-hmm. I feel like being outside in the outdoors is really helps your, my mental health. You have all these details that are around the house, but to get out, nature is really random and, and nature mm-hmm. is beautiful. And so when you get out there, then I think it kind of rolls back the the pressure on other things in life. And I just think it's healthy to be outside periodically. Absolutely. Yes. And more and more, I think mental health professionals have been pushing that just because of, like I said, our, our history as humans is mm-hmm. we are 
a part of nature. We are yeah. we are an animal, essentially. We often forget. We we kind of like separate ourselves from animals, but we are an animal. <laughs> we're part of nature. You we're, know? we're part of yeah. nature, and we, I think we I think nature. that's nature needs us also. <laughs> yes, obviously. Yeah, gotta um, go start those fires on Lingam Island. Right. Somehow. I'm curious to know what I mean. We focused heavily on getting rid of the honeysuckle and and you know starting these fires that help germination and things like that. Is that really the main thing that you do when you're kind of maintaining Langham Island or are there other things that you... I think there's a whole, it's kind of just a network of tasks that you kind of have to do in the right order and layer on top of each other. We do a lot of seed collection as well. Steve had mentioned you, or Steve or Trevor, someone mentioned grabbing, you know, grass seed from a part of the island where there's healthy colonies of these prairie grasses growing and we save it for later and try to spread it to areas where we have removed the honeysuckle from. Okay. Um, so you've yeah, got I think to be, Trevor brief, yeah, maybe briefly yeah, touched we've, on that. Yeah. We've got to be able to identify, you know, which plants are the good native plants that we want to collect seed from. Um, you've got to be able to recognize one plant from another to figure out if it's a good plant you want to help or a bad plant you want to, you know, kind of discourage. We do a little bit of, of manual management of other types of invasive plants on the island as well. So seed collection and plant identification is a great one. We have botanists that come out and do basically just inventories of which plants are currently being found on the island. And they do that, try to do it, I think, annually, at least as often as we can, just to kind of see if our work has brought anything back that wasn't previously present last time they surveyed. Um, It's a wide array of skill sets, and you need as many people doing as many of them as you yeah, can working together. Yeah. yeah. And people enjoy seeing the birds when they're out Oh, there. there's so many great birds out there. And the <laughs> insects. A bird watcher. I love yeah. the, all the grasshoppers in the fall. I think they're really Tons cool. Tons of dragonflies, huge dragonflies out there. There's there's a good ecosystem there, and it, it shows. You can see the whole network of life that is dependent on these plant species kind of starting to come back to the island a bit, which is... Just amazing to see. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. It, yeah, when when the group first started, it was a it was triage. You know, we were getting out there and just trying to get a foothold back on the island, and we getting some mallows back, and then that motivated us. But as the years have gone on, it's gotten like you mentioned, it's gotten a lot more nuanced. There's a lot more layers upon layers of things that just. And from the original flora list from 1990, well, there's still plants missing that aren't on that that aren't growing out there yet. Mm-hmm. So they, but could, they could, they could, if mm-hmm. you if your work continues and it's consistent, those could come back. Could, as right? Yeah, there's some pretty rare plants on that list that haven't been yet seen out there again. So that's you know, restoration is the future for Langham Island, and and the continued stewardship. Hopefully, that list becomes more complete over time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some some seeds of some plants only remain viable for a couple of days, but a lot of these, especially prairie plants, have evolved that their seeds can remain viable for years and years in the ground. And so if you get rid of the honeysuckle and restore fire, yeah, we're we're very hopeful that some of those can still come back. Yeah, renew the renew the cycling of the seed bank kinda of to see what will come back up if it gets light and fire to clear stuff off the top and some chance to compete again. Yeah. We've talked about the, obviously the importance of this work, but I feel like to kind of put it out there to almost make your argument since you're all here, why is this so important? Why is all of this important? You know, to really get down to it, why should someone care about the preservation of Langham Island or any area that is like Langham Island, why why should it matter to me or <clears throat> any everyday person? Mm-hmm. <laughs> why, is it, why is it important? <laughs> just to yeah. so, put I, it out there. Yeah, you know. l- let me just say it's um, it's important to me because it's kind of a part of who I am. I need to be out, as John mentioned. I need to be out in nature on a regular basis, or I go nuts. (laughs) I I mean, I, 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 so for me, it, there, it's nothing more than that. I'm thrilled that I can have a hand in helping endangered species and stuff like that, but set that aside. I need it for you. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. I love that. I love that. 
I guess we yeah we can go down in a row if you want, Molly. If <laughs> yeah, you sure. Go next. Well, um, why do I think it's important? I agree with everything that Steve said. Um, I, I feel like all of us probably do need to be out there for personal reasons. Yeah. Um, if I can't make it to the island, I am certainly out somewhere else trying to get as deep into the woods as I can. But I think just even on a larger scale, just thinking about the diversity of these species of plants and the entire network of life that has evolved in this area, there is just a profound sadness to me that would result from the mallow being lost. I don't think we know quite what the fault would be of losing too many of these nodes on the network of life in this area. So I think to me it's just important to give stuff a chance to live its life for nature's sake to some degree. Nature isn't separate from us in my mind. We are right there with all these other species yeah, of plants and earlier. animals. Yeah, yes. and we don't really know where we are in this spider web connected to them. So I just think there's a value in keeping these connections to stuff we've evolved alongside yeah. as well. Well said. Trevor? Yeah, I mean, I echo all of that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it goes to me, I think that we are connected to nature. We are part of nature. And there it's your, the diversity, uh, you know, of plants on the island or the diversity of, uh, in your gut biome or whatever. We're all healthier people. We're all healthier communities when we're working together, thriving together. And, and if we view ourselves in nature as part of that, the more species that we have around the, us, the healthier. I was just at the Kankakee Watershed Conference. Kankakee River is doing great. Why? Because the diversity of mussels is there. The diversity of fish is there. It's, you know, people celebrate that. It's great. It's no different in, in nature. If we just had a forest full of honeysuckle, it would be very quiet there. There would be very few insects, which means very few birds, which means <laughs> your walks wouldn't be as enjoyable. My mental health wouldn't be that great. Yeah, uh, I don't hear any birds chirping. Yeah. <laughs> I, Isn't this supposed to be peaceful? I'm supposed to hear birds singing. And, and, and our oaks will, would sl slowly uh, fizzle out and if something were to happen to honeysuckle and that's all we had, then we'd really be left with nothing. Yeah. So pr providing safe harbor for as many species as possible uh, globally, not just here. You know, this is a, a global issue that we can tie directly back to 20 acres in Kankakee County uh, is important. And while it might seem th those 20 acres add up over large scales and the more we can put effort into that and is great. And I do think it's it, to have an active group out there as like I said earlier, an incubator for inspiration for getting folks out to do this other places is is a value that is priceless without that exposing people to this type of relationship with nature. My kids might grow up without having that connection, that deeper connection and understanding, and I don't want that for them. So. Yeah. Yeah, That I mean, that pretty much piggybacks off of, in my mind, what I think about and why I think it's important is just to the fact of the whole food chain. It just, and you you pointed on that perfectly of how it just continues to affect the next thing and the next thing exactly. and the next thing. You're talking about, well, it, you know, it affects the insects and then the birds. And then and then from there, it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a chain reaction event. So eventually, where does that food chain go? It's going to lead to us mm -hmm. eventually <laughs> and then affect us. Sure, it, it might there might be several steps between that Kankakee mallow and man. But eventually... Mm -hmm. It's going to link up. And, you know, human crops also need pollination. There's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's, a, right. there's, a, there's lot, a lot of links there for yeah. sure. So it just eventually it does come back to us whether we can see that or not. It's there. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. that's, yeah. in, in my mind, I think that's why it's important. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we define ourselves here in Kanki by the river often. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Lang Langham Island, the Kanki Mallow are of and part of the river. And, you know, I think we should, like I said, I think it's a point of pride for me being a Kanki. Now, you know, mm -hmm. I consider myself a Kankakee resident and diehard, and I want, I want to preserve yeah, that. That's actually, part of what makes it unique to live here. That's a good point. I did want to mention, I grew up out in Limestone, probably across the parking lot from the river about that area, and I had never heard of the Kankakee Mallow till I moved away to go to school in Michigan. <laughs> okay. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so I, I grew oh, up, you, you know. Grew, you yeah. grew up where the Kankakee I, Mallow I is. I grew up You're like, in, what? I grew up in Kankakee, and I mentioned it. I had, I had um, as a student up at the University of Michigan, a natural area steward job, which is how I got into eco restoration, Gosh, right? Um, and my boss there <laughs> was like, oh, you're from Kankakee, like the Kankakee Mallow. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so just having, you know, that the connection to the land that I am from, just yeah. actually a, a physical connection now. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into a lot of the nature restoration that I've worked on in the area. It, it actually does connect you to the land you live on yeah. in a different way. I do I do think that's one aspect that is just greatly rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny how that, that <laughs> stuff works it out. It is very funny. <laughs> Gosh, were you were you going to say something, Trevor? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I feel like this conversation could go on and on and on, but I'm really grateful, Trevor, and John and Molly and Steve. I'm grateful that all of you are here to talk about Langham Island and and just a little bit uh, more about uh, just nature in our region. We should definitely join the workday and follow Friends of Langham Island yes. on Facebook. Yes, uh, I was going to yeah. throw that out there too. If you want to just learn more or stay up to date or get involved, all of the above, Friends of Langham Island on Facebook, you guys are constantly updating that, mm -hmm. which is really cool to see. And uh, you make it easy for someone to see when the next workday is because you make an event Absolutely. On, the, on the Facebook page so people can see, oh, I know they're going to be Shoot us an email. You need to sign a waiver, but other than that, <laughs> oh right, I'm sure. Yeah, I got to sign a waiver, right? Yeah, yeah. once you got that waiver, just yeah, keep you don't coming have to back. Read the waiver. You just have to sign yeah. it. Don't read it. <laughs> you should read it and also sign it and come to a workday. Friends of Langham Island. Come Facebook. out once or twice or three times a year. You can appreciate it in the different seasons. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And you don't have to be religious about coming to every workday. You can come as often as you can or as often as you want, and we'd be happy to have anyone who wants to join. Okay, awesome. I'd also okay. like to thank you, Jake, for hosting us. Yes. Oh, of course. Yeah. This was an honor. Thank you, guys. Uh, this was amazing. Honestly, I feel like we could go for another hour or two, and I know we could easily just on Langham Island alone and then beyond that there's just a lot to cover and it makes me excited so thank you guys for coming by you're welcome thank you for having us Thanks, yeah. thank you that does it for this episode of kankakee podcast i'm jake lamore thank you so much for listening we are proudly presented by pewter pros stitch prints and digital world design family of businesses celebrating 25 years of small business ownership in kankakee county you can learn more at mypewterpros.com stitchprints.com and digitalworlddesign.com also a special thank you to our patrons for helping make this episode possible including don geisinger diana crowley joseph lamont bill paracus Lori. Crayoch, Karen Bishop, SLS Home Inspections, Seth and Mary Berkey, Jake Lee, Jesse Arsenault, Dave Barron, Veronica Featherston, John Sullivan, Sue Hornung, Samantha Rocknowski, Lake Iverson, Travis Garcia, Jane Bostwick, Dawn Harrison, Simon Topless, Scott Wright, Carrie O'Connell, Jamie Race, Joanne Berry, Anthony Vicelli, Eric Olson, Nolan Bukowski, Natalie Flagel, Carl Erps, Jeff and Rosa Carroll, Teague Dreenan, Sandy and Steve Twait, and Rose Lucky. To become a podcast patron, go to kankakeepodcast.com and then click on the patron tab. If you pledge $5 or more per month, you'll also hear your name announced on an episode of the podcast. There is also access to extended versions of episodes, video versions, and more. This episode was edited by our intern, Colin Farrell, and our theme song, written and performed by Lupe Carroll, recorded by Daniel Bishop. 